So half of you are covered by this pillar, so that's safe for me, I feel. And then the other, I'd speak to you lot over here. You lot, forget it. I'm, I'm done with you. Anyway, my name's Dominic Morrow, um, and I'm going to talk about getting started with laser cutting. And this talk is aimed at people that aren't super experienced with laser cutters, but have seen a laser cutter or think it's something they might want to do. And we're going to explore around the reasons you might not be doing that. Um, so what is laser cutting? So the level of laser cutting I'm going to be talking about is the sort of home, hobbyist, small business, small enterprise level. Um, might be using something like a diode laser engraver or a CO2 water-cooled laser engraver or perhaps, if you're super fancy, an uh, air-cooled RF laser. Um, I won't be talking about... Um, Well, this is fun. There we go. I won't be talking about high-powered industrial laser cutting. So I'm not talking about big machines that cut steel uh, and use inert gases and that sort of thing. I'm more talking about the sort of laser you'd be happy having in your bedroom. Well, maybe in your kitchen. But uh, uh, this sort of thing, I'm happy to discuss it later with people if they're interested, but that's not my area of specialty. Um, yeah, not covered by this talk. So if you're here for that, I'll, I'll give you a moment to leave. So, stimulating the emissions of coherent photons. That's how we're making laser beams. Um, it's very cool, but isn't something you need to know in order to laser cut. But we'll talk about it for a second anyway. We're talking about pushing high voltage in the case of a CO2 laser into CO2 gas, getting uh, the electrons excited, emitting a photon, getting loads of those photons in a small space, whizzing them up and down and then pushing them out through a uh, partial reflecting lens to make uh, a non-visible beam of laser light capable of being focused and cutting through a material. Which is pretty exciting stuff. But why would you want two laser cuts? Well, ideally, you're starting with a project. There's something you want to do. There's something you want to make. There's a part of something you're already doing that you feel would be uh, made easier or done better with a laser cutter. Um, and I find that it's generally better to approach laser cutting from the point of view of having a project uh, whilst I know a lot of you may be interested in just having that as a tool within your arsenal of tools. You've seen them and you kind of want one. But to move forward with laser cutting, definitely good to start with a project. And I've got a couple of uh, case files, if you like. My friend Paul Beach, who you see up on screen here, he's a case. Uh, and uh, talking of cases, he um, was the designer of the original, well, the current Raspberry Pi logo. And for that piece of work, he won himself a Raspberry Pi from the original uh, selection and got himself one of the laser cut uh, Raspberry Pi cases from Adafruit. And you can see it's the, to the, well, as you're looking at it, to the left of his head there in the clear acrylic. And he put it together and put the Raspberry Pi in it and he thought, hmm, I can do better than this. And so now he had a project. He wanted to make a Raspberry Pi case uh, and the result of that was the pi bow and you can see one of the original ones there on the the very left side of your screen um, it's a stacked uh, case made from colored acrylic uh, that fits around a raspberry pi um, that became the business pimeroni and uh, paul tells me to, to this point they've made uh, about a hundred thousand of those uh, pi bow cases uh, and there's a, a whole business built around supplying parts to Raspberry Pi. And this all came from a project, taking it from a prototype. Uh, he did that at Access Space in Sheffield. It was an old maker space. I don't think it's there anymore. Uh, where he had access to laser cutter. Uh, developed that prototype and then got himself a laser cutter and started cutting them out and selling them. I've got another case file. Laura Matthews, artist, uh, 
is here in the audience somewhere, um, a university um, working on anatomical animals and uh, making some uh, fully uh, animatable rats and was introduced to laser cutting and then has taken uh, her love of animal anatomy from that point through into getting a laser cutter and then developing these extremely intricate puppets and there will be a puppet walkabout immediately after this talk starting somewhere out on the road there. Um, so it just shows you with uh, a project in mind and some determination and the ability to get access to this equipment with a laser cutter, it opens up possibilities for you and it's a skill builder, you know, from prototyping to production. So if you already have a project in mind, why are you not cutting already? So I have lots of conversations with people about laser cutters and there's a few common themes that come up as to why you might not be already using a cutter. And obviously one of those is the cost. And laser cutter cost can be extremely confusing because on the one hand you can find a cutter that looks to be about 100 to 250 pounds. On the other hand, you can buy one that costs well over 200,000 pounds. So, you know, that can be confusing. If a cutter can cost uh, 200,000 pounds or 100 pounds, which one are you supposed to get? So I'm going to give you an example of the range here. So on the left there, we've got a Sculpt Fun S9. It's a diode-based laser, so that uses a little semiconductor and we're pushing electricity onto that semiconductor to excite our uh, electrons and make a photon and push that out for a little lens and it will do some amount of work below that lens, mostly engraving. Some of the better ones will do some cutting. They've got air assist now that's blowing air onto the workpiece to help it cut. And a machine like that is about... Come on, oh dear. I've got a little animation with the price that comes up. There we go, 150 pounds. <laughs> and the one on the right hand side, that's a machine made by a company called Trotex, an Austrian company. They produce extremely well engineered laser cutters generally with very high-end air-cooled uh, tubes on them, used in industry, often with a service package, and a machine like the one shown in this picture here is about £150,000 and would be expected to work extremely well with an extremely high level of precision and if it falls over, you'd expect an engineer to be turning up very quickly to sort that out for you. What's a more reachable workaday laser cutter? Something like this. This is a modern cutter. This is a white cloud. Um, it's sold through a number of places. You can buy one on Amazon. And it's going to cost you around about three and a half thousand pounds. That's for a new cutter that will sit on your desktop. Um, we'll use modern software, it will have a camera built into it to help you lay things out, it'll have auto-focusing within it, it'll come with some form of extraction, it'll come for with some form of uh, cooling for the laser tube, it'll come with something to blow air down onto the workpiece, everything will be taken care of for you. It's going to be around about this size. gives you an idea. Then you've got something like this. OM Tech is a relatively new company onto the market and what they've done is they've looked at good uh, well-selling um, or rapidly selling uh, popular laser cutters and they've taken those models away to a factory, they've retooled them, they've improved them and then they generally are supplying directly to the consumer through things like AliExpress or eBay or Amazon and you can expect to spend about £1.8,000 on a machine like this one which is about this big and would have an external chiller, an external air supply um, 
and you would need to have a, a good extraction pipe going outside to take your fumes. But this is very much a, a, a sort of a beginner level, mid-level machine. So that gives you an idea of cost, what you're going to get. So on the one hand, you might be playing around with a, a frame, XY frame with a laser diode on it, spending little more than 100 to 150 pounds. Maybe if you're looking online, you can find something like that going second hand. Someone bought one during the pandemic and they're sick of it already and you might be able to pick it up for a, 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 a very small price and that might get you started. Or on the other hand, if you're ready to get a bit further, you might be able to pick up something like I was just showing you. Next concern, people are worried about safety, and they should be, because like any tool, there are risks uh, with using the tool. Um, laser cutters can and do catch fire, uh, and if left unattended, you know, it could be a serious risk. With the CO2 laser cutters and the larger cutters, you're talking about some serious amounts of, of voltage being pushed into the tube. Uh, and you know, you know it's in there, that could be quite a scary thing. Not to mention the fact you're all dealing with mains voltage as well in a machine that has water pumping around it. Blinding laser beams, where are those beams going? How do I keep my eyes safe? Well, these are all concerns that people have uh, before they get into laser cutting. But I am going to address some of these concerns, don't worry. And uh, the one that I think people often forget is you're creating a lot of smoke. The, something that people say to me constantly when I'm laser cutting is, oh, I love the smell. And then they're huffing the smell in. I'm like, you don't really want to breathe that in. Uh, safely extracting your fumes to the outside or filtering those is, is, in, and it as, is as important a consideration as the risk of fire or the scary voltages or the blinding laser beams. Well, just to, to address some of these concerns, you should consider something like a laser cutter to be very much like a table saw or a hand drill um, or a, a chisel. You wouldn't set a chisel up and leave it running unattended. You can't. You wouldn't have a table saw running and then push work for it from the other room, you know, or expect to leave it in a room with your kids or something whilst it's whirring away. You, you would be... Uh, you, you would think that was odd. And the same goes for a laser cutter. It's not a, a, a paper printer. It isn't something you can leave on a desk somewhere and get on, with, you know, send a job to and leave. There's a very real danger of fire. So if you think of it as a tool that you're actively using, then that risk becomes almost nil. I've seen a lot of laser cutters that have been uh, burnt to a, a husk. And in every single case, they were unattended. So unattended laser cutters catch fire. Attended laser cutters, you open the lid and you just pat the fire out and it doesn't get any worse. Voltages, with all the doors closed and operating the cutter properly using your interlocks and safety features, there should be no concern about voltages. At no point will you be holding both ends of your laser tube whilst running it. Well, if you do, I mean, you know, you've had it. As for blinding laser beams, within the confines of your laser's enclosure, the beam should only ever be travelling between a few mirrors and a lens, and the focus part of the beam will be facing down right into your workpiece. And often, that the focal uh, distance from the lens to the workpiece is two inches or two and a half inches, no more than that, uh, under 60 uh, millimetres. Uh, and that's where the, the real energy and focus of the work is. Of course, you know, like you, you shouldn't take any needless risks, you shouldn't defeat safety features, you shouldn't direct beams out of the case for fun, unless that's your cup of tea. But if they are your concerns, the machines are designed to ensure that you aren't interfacing with that laser radiation. Smoke inhalation, on, a, on the other hand, that's something you should definitely take seriously. Make sure that you're extracting your smoke well and outside of your uh, working environment. Simply putting a pipe out of a window may not be the solution, although I have to admit I've done that on many occasions. If you've got a window open and you're pushing smoke out of it, the chances are that smoke is simply going to blow back in through your window and you're going to end up with an environment that's quite smoky. So do take that one seriously.
Why aren't people laser cutting? Uh, no access to a laser cutter. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, not having access to a laser cutter uh, is going to prevent you doing, uh, doing anything with one. Um, but I'm going to talk about that uh, a bit later on, uh, how you might get access or get started with it. Uh, not sure how it works. Um, so um, I currently work for a company called Lightburn. Lightburn makes software for laser cutters, uh, so full disclosure there. I'm wearing a t-shirt. Um, and I did a quick roundup of the other people that are working in support and people that are working in uh, community within the, that software and asked them what common questions were. And uh, one or two people told me that uh, a lot of people that asked them about laser cutters just didn't really have a good understanding of how it worked and the terminology to use to understand what it was. They knew what they wanted to do but they couldn't describe it in a way that they could put that information into Google and learn how to do it. So that is a sort of a barrier. And that's uh, something I can relate to in trying to find an unusual bit of hardware or something. You know, you know what you want, you know what it looks like, but you can't say round thingy with hole at top that has a screw thread that's made out of brass. The results of that are going to be pretty poor. So if you've got something like the McMaster car catalogue with lots of pictures in it, tells you all the names of the items, suddenly you've got this special special way of finding an item online uh, and, and you've got the right name and you can find it by googling it or searching on, on your choice of search engine. And so that can be a barrier for people. And we found that within the Lightburn community and the Lightburn forum, the best way to explore that, again I was mentioning earlier, is by talking to that person about what it is they want to achieve, what the end goal is of their project, walking them through that and finding their level of understanding and then introducing them to the techniques and tools that they might want within a software or within a design software long before they've even touched the laser cutter and then helping them take that design to the cutter. Some people wonder if they've heard of vaguely G-code. Does that mean I have to write G-code? Uh, and the answer is no. You know, the best skill that you can uh, learn to get started in laser cutting is uh, to learn how to draw vectors. And we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, lack of support. Uh, my bane as someone that goes out to look at and fix laser cutters is when they say, well, I've been on Facebook for them. And it's just a bit of a nightmare of uh, wild opinions and people sort of one-upping each other or gatekeeping, you should laser cut, but you should not because you don't have this magical knowledge. And forums can be a terrible place to try and pick up a, an answer or learn something about what you're doing. Um, I would recommend uh, going somewhere like the Lightburn Forum, which is actively moderated by people that are paid to do it. Uh, and you're much more likely to find some good information somewhere like that. There are others. Um, Sawmill Creek's one that springs to mind, although that can be a little bit toxic from time to time. Space. Laser cutters take up a lot of room. Even the smallest ones are a lot deeper than a desk. Um, and often require uh, space behind them to be able to put uh, extraction and cables and cooling and all that sort of thing in. So if you don't have the space, if you're living in a London flat, something like that, that can be a real challenge. Um, and there's no easy answer for that one. Uh, extraction and filtration isn't always good enough to have a laser cutter in your living space. So you know, think about that carefully before you get into it. What do you really need to know to laser cut? Oh, okay, well, this is where I'm going to talk about types of people. Not that I want to pigeonhole anybody. But when I first got into laser cutting, uh, uh, my business partner at the time, uh, Martin Rainsford, who's uh, here in Null Sector, and myself went to a model engineers fair. And of the people we spoke to at that model engineers fair, I could divide them clearly into two distinct groups. There was people who wanted to make things. And we showed them the laser cutter and they said, wow, I could make railway carriages, scenery, I could make battlefield scenes, I could put brickwork into uh, little buildings that I'm making, I could make rigging with that. And then there was the other group of people who were the people like, oh, I could make that. And they wanted to build the laser cutter and tinker with the tool. Now, both of these groups of people have a worthy project. One of the groups, they want to make something with a tool. 
The other group, they want to make a tool. But I want to be really clear, those two groups have very different outcomes in mind. And what you might see often in somewhere like a hackerspace or makerspace is those two groups smushed into one group, where the making of the tool and the making things with the tool somehow has to coexist. So have a think if which of those two groups you might fall into, both perfectly worthy things, and think about that before you get a cutter. If you're very keen on tinkering with a tool, then buying uh, an XY axis diode kit might be for you or strapping a diode laser to your existing CNC rig. Uh, but if you're super interested in making something, the more made that tool can be, the sooner you're going to be getting the outcomes of making something with that tool that you might want. Personally, I think the one thing that you could take away that would that help you if you really know very little about uh, computer-aided design or making graphics or uh, uh, making files for a laser cutter is understanding the difference between a vector graphic and an image, uh, a raster graphic, a JPEG, a PNG, a GIF. And the difference is a vector graphic, if we were to zoom out from that, it's always going to stay crisp and clean. It's going to be mathematical. It's going to be a series of points plotted out that a machine can understand as spaces within uh, a, a world, you know, a flat plane or a 3D plane in the case of a, a printer. But uh, if you can learn to make vector graphics, then you can make almost anything on a laser cutter. So if you don't have a cutter, but you think it's something you'd like to do, and you want to be uh, hit the ground running, to use a phrase, learning any kind of software capable of making a vector graphic is going to pay dividends for you. Here are some common ones. There are many more. Maybe you already know one that you like. If, that, if you have one you like and you're already using it, use that. Um, what you're looking to produce is a, S, a SVG file or a, a DXF file. These are file formats for the movement of vector graphics that can be imported into a software that will talk to a laser cutter or engraver. Um, here's some common uh, modern laser cutter interface softwares. Uh, when I started in laser cutting, the, the modern software, the RD works was around, but it, it wasn't terribly common. Uh, and softwares for cheaper cutters were pretty bad. Uh, the one you see here, the, the uh, screen that looks a bit sort of Windows 3.1, that's a software called MoshiDraw that would come native with a, a type of laser cutter called a K40 that you could pick up for about £150. And it's absolutely nonsensical to me. I was never really able to get it to do anything much other than to uh, drag the head of the laser down the side of the machine. Uh, also, um, until very recently, a lot of laser cutter software has used uh, sort of a dongle. I work for Lightburn. This is a, 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 an older version of Lightburn, but this is the interface. There are modern softwares out there. And as you can see, you're bringing a vector drawing into a graphical workspace, and then you're laying it out, and you're simply choosing layers and giving them speeds at which the laser cutter is going to move and amounts of power that you're pushing into the laser to help you either cut or engrave something. And a lot of these softwares also have some drawing functionality too, uh, allowing you to do various layouts and uh, uh, move nodes around, duplicate things, optimize your uh, cut settings, uh, make sure that you're, say if you're looking to do production, make sure that you're cutting through your material in the most optimal way, the head of your cutter isn't moving down here and then up here and then over here, taking twice as long as you might want. Where can you get access to a cutter if you don't have one? Well, the obvious answer is your local hackerspace if you have one. Very often they'll have a laser cutter, and if they don't, maybe get involved with a hackerspace and talk them into getting one. It's a very good tool for prototyping, typing. Uh, lots of libraries are now getting makerspaces put inside, uh, and they will often have a laser cutter. And then your local secondary school very likely does. 
Of course, getting access to a school is, is, is not straightforward, but there are schools that do have maker clubs and also run uh, drop-ins for adults from time to time. They're pretty rare, but maybe talk to your local school and see if that's something that can be done. And then there are online laser cutting services. So if there is something that you're currently working on and you're wondering if maybe that would uh, benefit from having access to a cutter, if you uh, Google um, laser cutting, there's very likely a company that will do it for you. Now, there's lots of profile-making companies that will laser cut metal, but there are many that will also do things in acrylic or MDF or plywood for you. Thank you. Um, and I've actually reached the end of my talk. But I'm going to be over in the, not in the Q&A tent, but over in the RGB pavilion, up the top of the road here, uh, you'll see a, a, a red, a blue and a green tent. And if you have any questions or you want to come and see a laser cutter in operation, or if you'd like one of my brilliant coasters, which are absolutely free of charge, although there is only a limited number left, do come, say hello, and uh, Laura is going to be showing some of her extremely intricate laser cut puppets up there as well. Thank you very much for being such an attentive audience. <laughs>